Okay, so apparently there is something called a capstone that we were gonna work on through semester one, and I was like, I think I'm gonna create a fugue. Wait, but why would I pick a fugue? Let's go back and see how we got here. Eight months ago. So this journey started back in April of 2023 when Mr. Braverman, my choir teacher, came up to the front of the class and was like, hey, you should listen to this song right here. Now, after listening to it, I actually got really inspired because the arranger of that piece, Ward Swingle, managed to combine traditional classical music with a jazzy swing, in a, in a sense, I guess. And I swore on my life that I would make that a reality and do the exact same thing myself. Bruh. And so, I put that in place for my capstone. Now, as some of you guys may know, I know how to play the piano. This can be proven because the channel that you're watching this from, I'm a founder of. I'd like to describe myself as a humble person, and I want to be known for being a nice person, not for my achievements. Oh. I, now, I chose this view for my capstone project choice because I know how to arrange stuff, see some of my duets listed right over here and i thought why not give composing a try because i want to use my music theory and knowledge to try and play any song that i want and i also just to try out something new so going to october when i got my capstone application accepted i got started right away i knew a lot about music already but i didn't really know much about fugues as a whole I just thought that the melody was the most important because that is what makes the song sound good. And I just thought the voices don't really need to have that good of a structure. As long as it sounds good in the end, then it seems fine. However, I was massively proved wrong in the end. So stay tuned to find out what happened. Now it was time for me to get started on my fugue. The first step that I had to do was learn fugal terms. This will help me understand fugues at a deeper level and also assist me with the next step of my project. What I had to do here was get out my first source, which is my ARCT analysis booklet. Here's a little preview, I won't show everything in detail. But basically what it does is it explains everything at a very professional level so then I can understand everything. And I basically wrote this down all on a piece of paper. I'll put that up right over here. <laughs> But now that I've finished all that stuff, it was time to move on to the second step of my project, analyzing fugues. So for those of you who aren't into classical music, there's this composer named Bach who created a lot of fugues. And in order for me to create my own fugue, I have to first understand how he composed his in the first place. And this is where the analyzing fugues come into head. So what I have to do is, let's just say I'm gonna pull up a fugue right over here. I have to take a look at this entire piece and then identify sections. For example, this little section over here, if you can see my mouse cursor, counts as blah, 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 blah. And this section over here is called so forth. I will explain this later in the video, but just to get a brief understanding of this. I had to do this six times. And let's just say it was a pretty big pain but it was all good in the end because it helped me develop confidence about the, the knowledge about this, this topic. Ooh, 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 look at all of these bad boys. Before I actually start composing my fugue, I have to do one more thing, and that's confirm a few minor details listed right over here. This includes the key that my fugue's gonna be in, how many voices there are gonna be in a fugue, the speed of the song, and also possible key changes, because those are very frequent in a few. And in the end, I decided to choose the key to be an F sharp minor, which is a beautiful key. It gives off such a longing effect, and I, I found that very effective for what I was trying to convey. Voices, I originally was going to do 3 to 4 for piano, and 6 to 8 for choir, but in the end I just kind of stuck with 3 to 4, notably 4, because that's going to take way too much of my time. Possible key changes are listed there, and I actually used some of them in my piece, as you'll find out later. And lastly, the speed of the song. 
This was a difficult decision because I actually had to tinker a little bit with it, but I eventually ended up with 75 beats per minute as it's a very nice tempo for the song. And for choir, I also increased it a little bit just to get that jazzy effect. But now with all of that out of the way, let's get the composing started. To start off my fugue, I had to begin the same way that Bach did, with a subject. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, the subject is basically similar to the topic of a conversation. Basically, it's the melody. And this came up in a pretty weird way, actually. What happened was that I had a dream where I heard this melody, and I was like, screw it, it's gonna work. And I used it. So let's go down to the piano and I will show you the melody. Okay, so since I was feeling depressed, I decided to make this the main melody. Hey, that's pretty good. And this has a lot of cool features that I will be explaining later in the video. So with step one done, it's time to create the counter subject. Ah yes, the counter subject. Now the definition of this is pretty self-explanatory. It's a counter to the subject, or in other words, it's another melody. Now this is used to accompany the answer, which is basically the subject, but moved down or up by a few pitches. Now generally a counter subject is kind of difficult to come up because you need to make it sound good with the subject. And as you can see, I actually failed my first counter subject here. Mission failed. But with a little bit of tweaking, I managed to create one. And also a second one as well, with a little bit of inspiration with harmonies. So, without further ado, let's go take a look at the counter subjects. Take a look at this first example. The left hand is playing the melody, and everything in the right hand is the counter subject. Same with the second example. The left hand is playing the melody, and the right hand is playing the second counter subject. With everything in place, I could basically create the beginning of my fugue. Easy. But there is one thing that I am missing. A link. Or a transition. This is basically to help the song flow and also to avoid repetition. Nice. Now, you can literally take anything for inspiration for these transitions. But I decided to go with some descending fifth sequences and some new motives, as we'll see later. And it turned out to be very effective. The music that you're actually listening to right now is my first transition. So I think it's pretty cool. Within the blink of an eye, I'd completed the enunciation section of my fugue, or the beginning part. This can be shown from measures 1 to 14, listed right over here. Now I have to complete the modulatory section of the fugue which gets a lot more complicated, and I have to actually be creative, which I'm not good at. The first thing that I gotta do is create an episode. Now, I told you earlier that a link was a transition, but an episode is also a transition, hey, except it's a lot bigger and more important. There can also be modulations, which I explained earlier in the video. And let's see how I came up with my first episode. My first episode is four bars long, and I turned out to actually be really stubborn when making these episodes. Basically, the step-by-step -step process was I first decided to make this bass sequence that goes down over time into a nice little finishing area. But then after that, I didn't really know what to do. So I decided to go back to where it all started from the subject, or the melody. I put that in the tenors, right over here, and then I just kind of filled everything else with random stuff. And it worked out pretty well. I repeated this process over and over again, and I will show you that later. After my first episode, I decided to feature the melody once again in the alto section. Now this is called a redundant entry, and that's basically where a voice that's already presented the melody gets to do it again. Now I had a step-by-step -step process for these parts, and it was put the melody in, then add a counter subject for possible, that'll be in the bass section, and then just kind of fill in everything else. It was extremely dumb, but I managed to make it work. 
Now going on to the second episode, right over here starting at measure 22, this was quite the challenge because I wanted to modulate the piece to the key of E major, as you guys saw before. What I first did to transition the piece is take counter subject one and then put that as the main little piece of this part. Then I just filled everything in and then finished with a nice little coda at the end to mark the beginning of a new section. And I think that was a lot easier than the first time, so I'm quite proud of myself. I also heard from the teacher that the video has to be a maximum of 15 minutes, but I don't think I'm gonna listen. Screw that, I have, to have more stuff to explain. After completing this not so hard of an episode, I decided to present the melody again, but in a different way. I'm about to end this I did this through the use career. of a stretto, which is basically where two, three, or even four voices all sing the melody at relatively the same time. One of the advantages of my melody was that it basically consists of like two chords, so everything matches up and still sounds decently good. See how the tenors and sopranos get to sing the same thing? but everything still kind of tidies itself up. After that, I did another transition which led into the basses presenting their theme as shown right to my, I don't know which direction this is. But after that, I think it's time for a second I'm modulation. To complete this second modulation, I had to bring back something very special. I had to create a third episode. Yeah, these things get so annoying over time. For now, I didn't know what I was actually going to do to complete this transition, but I had an idea. I would create something from scratch. Oh my god, that's Yay, crazy. creative thinking. Well, not really, because I just used inspiration from what I already heard before. For example, I was already a big fan of Descending Falls, where the melody goes down from a really high position. So I implemented that for the first little part, used a pivot chord to secure the new key, and then just repeated another descending fall before the sopranos went and did their subject. So, I don't know. Was it really good? No. But was it manageable? Yes. It is what it is. To tackle the B minor section, I had to take a similar approach to how I composed the E major section. The format is relatively the same. Firstly, I let the sopranos have the melody right up here because they haven't had it in a while and I need to give everyone equal opportunities to sing and play the melodies. Then I followed with a brief transition, which then leads to the alto and bass sections, both playing the melody in stretto right over here. Now this was the easy part, but the final challenge comes up ahead, creating one last final episode to modulate back to the original key before the coda, and I'll explain that later. For this episode specifically, I gotta do a few things. Firstly, I gotta build a pipe so that the audience actually gets excited to listen to the rest of the few. Second, I gotta also modulate the key back into F sharp minor so that the tenors can sing the melody one last time before the coda, which is basically the end of the song. Now, I have a few ideas, so let's go see what they are and how I implemented them. Okay. So this last episode starts at measure 48, which is right over here. And I decided to kickstart things immediately with a descending fifth sequence. All the keys that are known to mankind are related through a wheel, and I use things in that order to get things done. After that, I finished up with a beautiful cadence in B minor, just to make it stylistic. However, I needed to still do the modulation. For that, I recreated a little bit of the subject in the soprano voice, followed by a brief pivot chord to secure the new key in F sharp minor. I added another cadence over here just to be sure, but I needed it to be very nice so that the tenors could finally do their melody over here. I'd say it wasn't too bad and it sounds decently good, but I probably could have came up with something better. But let's go back and visit the final part of my piece, the coda. Before we get to the last part, the tenors finally get to reintroduce the melody one last time over here. And now we get to the most important part of the field, the coda, or the end. 
Now, Warren Swingle was the exact reason why I got into fugues in the first place, and so, for his specific fugue that he adapted, I basically copied the ending right off, because, I don't know, it just sounds good. And so, I used it. And that's a nice way to end off my fugue. And there you have it, an entire fugue for piano. Now this was a big challenge in itself, but there were a few things that I still have to do. Firstly, I had to analyze my own fugue, just to make sure the structure was alright, and that there were no flukes. This can be shown right over here. The second thing that I had to do was transcribe the entire thing for four-part choir, which wasn't actually as hard as I thought, because all I had to do was just separate the four voices. However, composing the lyrics was not easy, and I had to just make sure that everything was all right by heart. Ward Swingle has a special way of scatting whenever he composes his pieces, and I needed a second source, which is basically his autobiography. This has everything that I needed to know, and I learned all of his lyric secrets in there. Here's a little snippet of me trying to experiment what lyrics I should use for a random part of the song. It took four hours, but it's good enough. You guys can change the lyrics if you're not satisfied with it, but I did my job. So after all this time, what did I accomplish exactly? Well, firstly, I created a fugue for piano that's extremely hard and I can't even play it. Yeah, I legitimately tried playing it two weeks ago at the capstone fair and it did not go out very well. Secondly, I created a fugue for choir that's too difficult for my school's choir to sing. You are dead. Apparently, Mr. Braverman looked at it and he was like, nuh uh, we can't do this. Ah, oh, I really outdid myself here. At the end of my journey, I've learned a lot of things. Firstly, I learned to think creatively and outside of the box, because most of the things here I had to come up from scratch, and this really pushed my limits. Another thing was just how to be a composer in general. Let's go. This was my first ever composition, and this gave me an in-depth experience of what it's like. Some other things that I learned along the way was that fugues need depth, and each voice actually needs to be independent in order for the song to sound good. I was massively proved wrong at the start, and I just realized how important this was. Lastly, I figured out how stubborn I was when it came to making music. I'm a perfectionist, and I know that, but I would always spend days or even weeks tweaking things to my satisfaction. Did I know about this already? Yes. Is it a bad thing? Not really, but I'm glad I'm more aware of this. Now moving forwards, will I ever learn how to compose again or make a new song? Probably not, I'm a stick to arranging, but I think it was all worth it in the end. Subscribe to the Class Italians, like this video, and stay tuned for more videos. Eddie, out.